What's happening everyone? Welcome back to the shop. Now you've probably seen by the thumbnail or by the title of this video exactly what it is that I'm doing. Not your everyday build, a little bit unusual, but it's been fun and challenging and there's loads of cool little processes going on with it. I'm about three quarters of the way through this project as I video this intro. So um, I think it could be a two-parter because there's so much going on with it that I wanna share with you. So um, I'm not sure how the edit is gonna go. So I'm trying to capture it all, but uh, it's, a jiu-jitsu belt display holder. So for the five grades of jiu-jitsu, the blue belt, or the white belt, the blue belt, the purple belt, the brown belt, and the black belt, it's for my jiu-jitsu academy where I train. So great bunch of people here. They've asked me would I be interested in making a display for the jiu-jitsu belts. There's loads of them available online um, that you can actually buy, but nothing really, I suppose, stood out. And uh, I wanted to make something that was, I suppose, personal to the actual club itself. So to take the club logo, which is this part of it here, is what I'm trying to replicate, and uh, to make to put the belts on. So there's loads of interesting processes about drawing it out, getting the shapes right, cutting it out, building a jig to glue it together. So it's just glued together on the table there. And uh, there's a few other cool little processes going on with it. So um, yeah, it's probably gonna be a two-parter. The main build and the glue up, and then the finishing on it. So I'm gonna do an oil finish, so I'll take you through that as well. So yeah. Without further ado, let's jump into this project. And uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty cool one, so let's do it. Okay, let's get into this project. I have it already drawn out here in front of me. So basically, this is what we're replicating. This is the club logo. So it's this part of the logo that we want to replicate. That's what I'm gonna make, so it's gonna be these elongated diamond shapes we're going to make from maple and then I'm going to infill in between them with some walnut and I've drawn it out here what I want to make. Now I didn't uh, videotape the whole drawing process but I'll just take you through it quickly. Essentially what I done was took some measurements from this as close as I could. Again this is only a patch so it's not super accurate but we can make it accurate when we draw it out. I multiplied the measurements by seven so I've literally scaled it up seven times. I originally scaled it up 10 times, it was a little bit big, so I brought it back to seven times the measurement that I was getting from this, and I drew this out, and that's how I got it. Now, in order to get this to lay it out the way we want it, if you think about it, this thing here is essentially half a circle, okay? And we have a straight line across the bottom here. If you can see that, so start off, just drew a straight line across the bottom, mark a center point. Then what we needed to do was take the center point of each of our diamond sections so that we could draw them out accurately. Now, obviously a half circle is 180 degrees and we have one, two, three, four, five even segments to the center of each point. So divide 180 by five, that gives us 36. So then I just took the protractor, hopefully this can all be seen on camera, can you? And just up from our baseline of zero degrees then, we measured one at 36, one at 72, and did the same on this side. That gave us our center line for each of our diamonds. Then we, all we had to do was to measure the, where the end of our diamond stops. So I roughly got the center, measured that distance, and made sure it was the exact same for all of these points. So um, it doesn't have to match this exactly, so long as our measurements for our drawing are exact and we keep everything the exact same in this relationship. That's what's important. Then we get the length of our diamond. We mark that on our straight line. And then if you see the top of the diamond then is essentially uh, an isosceles triangle or a triangle with two equal sides. I think that's an isosceles triangle, is it? I could be wrong, but it's two equal sides anyway. So all we have to do is draw a triangle on the top and then from these two points, work back to our point here, and that gives us each of our diamonds. So our diamonds are accurately located at um, the correct degree in our semicircle or our half circle. Our tops are just triangles with two even sides, so they were used to draw, and once we have our triangles drawn on then, we just needed to draw our two lines back to our points where our diamonds start. So hopefully that makes sense. It wasn't too hard to figure out. So we want to replicate this now. So I've already machined down some of the timber. I still have a bit more to machine down. So we're going to be making the diamonds from maple. So I have one just drawn out here on a maple board. I've machined these down to 20 millimeters thick. So they will be going on like that. And then we will infill these. Is that like a trapezoid? I'm not sure what kind of a shape you call that. A kind of a compressed rectangle. I think it's trapezoidal. I'm not sure. I'll probably sound like an idiot now, but anyway, they are gonna be made from walnut. So that's the plan. 
Once that's made then, we're going to fit our belts to it. So I have one belt here, just to give you an idea. So I have two ideas. Both ideas, we need to make this piece first. So the belts, the belts will either tie on with some nice traditional black rope, just straight to the front of our design, up along like that, white, blue, uh, purple, brown, and black. So the five belt colors for the five grades of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I think that's it now. Once I have this bit made, if it doesn't look good with the belts just straight flat onto it, what I might do is make a frame that stands proud off it from maple. It'll essentially be like the Roman numeral for two. You'll have a top piece, a bottom piece, and two uprights. And the belts will fit from the uprights, which will sit proud off this piece itself. But uh, yeah, first thing we need to do is make this. So we've got to cut out all the pieces now. I'm going to finish machining the rest of the timber and then we can start cutting this stuff out on the bandsaw. So let me go and um, yeah, machine this stuff up and then I'll get back to you. Okay, I have my five boards machined to 20 mil thickness um, for my star pieces. So I have four full stars and two half stars. If you can see, or four full diamonds and then two half diamonds. So hopefully I'll be able to split one of these straight down the middle and make these pieces. It's the cutting out of this, which is the difficult part. You know, drawing it out and uh, marking it out and getting everything dimensioned up is quite simple. But it, in order for this to be a proper 180 degree circle and all these pieces to be even, it's the cutting and then the jointing and a bit of planing work. That's the difficult part of this. And gluing it up is going to be quite fun as well. I've no idea. I'll have to build some sort of jig, I would imagine, in order to glue this together because there's no real way to clamp it. So that's all the fun stuff coming up. But um, for now, I need to mark out my five pieces just like this. And uh, that's very straightforward. So make sure we mark our face side so we know which side is up. Right, we have all five pieces marked out now, so it's time to cut these out on the bandsaw. So I'm just going to freehand this as close to the line, but not on the line as I can get. I have a nice wide blade in there, so it's uh, good for doing straight cuts. And um, the wider the blade that you have, the better, um, or the straighter the cut you'll be able to get. But anything with this is just a case of take your time, feed it nice and slow and just watch your line, because you can cut quite quickly with a bandsaw, and uh, it's very, very easy just to go straight into a piece or just go over that line that little bit. So if you're a little bit unsure or a little bit unsteady or whatever, stay back a bit, just a little bit more from the line. It just means you'll have more planing work to do afterwards. If you're a little bit more confident, go right up close to the line, but not on the line as you can get. And uh, that's it, simple enough. So let's start up the hoover now and start up this bandsaw and make a bit of noise and a bit of dust. So there's our first piece cut out. I went as close to the line as I dared. I'm really on the line all down this side. I'm a little bit off the line on this side, but that's not to worry. Um, I just want to leave as little bit, or as small amount of planing as possible. 
Um, so I will have to joint this edge and joint this edge, but I'll be using the hand plane to do that because this now points, like this corner and this point are too delicate to put through a machine. A machine will just flick that corner straight off and snap off that point. So a nice um, gentle plane with a hand plane now to get this right. And uh, yeah, so I have five more to do exactly like that. Again, like with the, uh, everything, just take your time. The more unsure or unstable you are, just stay a little bit away from that line. Watch your fingers, safety first, and uh, cut away. Right, this is where we have all our pieces are cut out now. Like I say, I want to take a hand plane now to all the jointable edges on these. So it's from this point to this point on every single one of these pieces. I need to get a good jointable edge. So it's going to be take that hand plane now, that Lloyd Nielsen low angle jack plane, and work these edges. So let's get on that and hopefully we do a good job. Right guys, I'm just going to plane down this now. I don't have too much to do, I just need to get this perfectly flat, just so I get, like I say, a nice jointable edge. I'm going to work from the corner back off the point, because if I work this way, I can risk busting out this corner, which is what I don't want to do. So um, this is where a plane like this, a really nice well-made plane comes in handy, because uh, it is flat, you know, it's smooth, and um, the blade is super, super sharp. So for this kind of precision work, it is ideal. So uh, yeah. I'm just going to take this nice and slowly now on all these pieces because this is critical that I get this right. Um, I'm going to make all the diamonds first just in case I get any of these angles slightly wrong. I'll put them all back on the board and then I will use the measurements for in between each of my pieces to make the walnut pieces so they'll all be numbered and individually made, so they might not all be exactly the same thickness. So we'll try and give ourselves as much leeway as we can. So I'll make sure, just keep checking that I'm working to my line. That's the beauty of these planes. I'm just taking just a such a fine shaving off it, and you can really walk down to a perfect edge, and that is as good as I get on a machine now. So um I'm pretty happy with that. Just take a jointed edge that I have already with this board and just check that. It's pretty perfect along there. I have a slight little gap in the top here where I ran in with the blade, but uh, I might have to fill that. It's one just one little mistake. So right up at the top there, the, the bandsaw blade just ran it just a little bit in. So I have a tiny little gap that I have to fill, but I don't want to go too much more because I have a perfect edge from there down now. So I'm going to do all the edges of these things now like that. And then I'm going to get back to you. So I won't bore you with me planing all five of these pieces. So let me get on with this now and I'll get back to you. Right, one very important thing as we're planing here is we need to check for square. So we always want to check and reference from our face side or our face edge, face side. So if I just put the plane on that, if you just look down along it, you see I have a small little gap on the side where my thumb is. So it's only the barest gap. We can check all the way down along. We're pretty good down along. So just up near the top, I have a little small gap. So I just want to take a small little bit off this edge here now just to square that up. So we want to check that as we go. As you can see, it's not too bad, it's only a little bit. But if we don't check, and if we actually plane like a chamfer into that, or a slight angle, we'll have a massive gap when we go to joint this together, even either on the front or on the back. So um, always reference your face side, and just check for square as you're planing. 
Okay, I'm not really sure where I left off in the video, but we were preparing these walnut um, blanks to cut out our pieces, and uh, we had a couple of dodgy ones, but luckily enough, I was able to machine them down and get most of the imperfections out of them. I think this was the worst one, um, so this piece will be getting lost. We won't be using it. It's in our wayside, so uh, it's happy days there, so it's gonna work out. I've just marked these out now, so I don't know will the camera pick it up, but uh, it's hard to see pencil line on the walnut, but I've put in the kind of trapezoid, or I think it's a trapezoid shape, but um, it's marked in, so I had to draw a center line and then use a protractor to get a, a bottom and a top line exactly 90 degrees to that center line, mark out the, my top width and my bottom width, width, and just draw my lines between. So that's how I did that. Again, it's hard to see the pencil on the walnut, so I didn't bother videoing it, but these five are marked out now, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna cut these out. I might square off the ends on the chop saw if that's possible, I'll have a look. And then we will cut these lines again with the band saw and it's a case of plane. So we're basically repeating the steps we did for the maple um, diamonds to make these guys. So let's rock on and get cracking with this. Okay guys, one mistake already, or hopefully the last mistake and the only mistake. So these pieces that I'm cutting out are supposed to measure 391 millimeters. I measured this one at 381 millimeters and cut it. So one of the five was too short. And because it's a tapered cut, the fact that this was shorter meant that it narrowed quicker. So it wasn't just a case of adding on that 10 mil bit at the end. I had to um, glue this piece back together and do this cut. So I'm gonna cut this in the bandsaw now. So yeah, that's just pure fatigue and tiredness. I haven't slept in about two days. Don't woodwork when you're tired. You're bound to make mistakes or injure yourself. So um, hopefully this won't look too bad once I cut it, um, plane it down, sand it back. You probably won't even see it, but uh, yeah, I'm out of walnut now, so no more mistakes, please. Right guys, this is where we're at. Everything is jointed up now, ready to be glued together. Um, it's gonna look like this. Now, I'm gonna mount the belts either flat on it, so it'll be drilling a series of holes up in a straight line like that to put the five belts, or I'm gonna make a frame that sits onto this with two uprights. So we'll have a cross piece, two uprights, and a cross piece, and the belts will be sitting proud off it. That might look nicer, I think, so I might make that out of maple, I'm not sure. I'll wait till I have all the belts here, and then I can make that decision. But um, it might just be a series of holes straight up and fix the belts to this. Now, gluing it. I have no idea how I'm gonna glue this yet. I might have to do it in stages. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's late at night now, and uh, this is the end of day three or four that I've been playing around with this thing, so I'm gonna to go to bed because I'm wrecked, and we shall see you momentarily. Right, we're on to gluing, and this is almost at a point of no return. Um, I've put a bit of thought into this. I hope it's gonna work. You could put dowels or biscuits into these to ensure that they don't move, but I actually want the pieces to move because I want to use their wedging action to try and get some compression here. So as I force these bits in, they will wedge as long as I stop all the other bits from moving, which is why I have all these, all the pieces are clamped this way, and then I can push them in one by one and adjust in my, um, just in my blocks to get this thing hold, all, to get it all clamped together. Now, I've just put little arrows between all my pieces so I can see exactly how they line up and onto my level. My level is gonna be essentially my straight edge for this to jig to sit against. And uh, yeah, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna set the camera up over here. You guys can watch, I'm not gonna say anything. This is gonna be pure concentration because if I mess this up, um, yeah, well, it'll all be all that work for nothing. And uh, we really don't want that to happen, so. Let me get you set up over there, guys. I'm just gonna hit record, and I'm gonna try and glue this thing. Let's do it. Okay. 
Right, there we go. It's uh, no return now, so it either works or it doesn't. But it actually doesn't look too bad, I hope. I should be able to get the angles fairly right. Everything looks the way I marked it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Right guys, there's just a quick close up of the jig. It's all glued up now. That was a bit of a rush, um, a bit of a panic. But um, once you start gluing, you kind of pass the point in no return and there's no way back. So I had to concentrate on the glue and not on the camera work. But you can see it now. So I just used my level to give me my straight edge for my piece to sit on, clamped that down. Then just used various blocks around to keep all the pieces from moving. We have long pieces just to catch the points here 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 and here and then these blocks just to catch the walnut pieces in between and then just compress everything down and like i say because these are shaped like wedges you will get that wedging action so as long as you stop the other pieces from moving back out because if you push in this piece this piece will shoot out over here and um, stop everything moving and then push everything in and you will get a nice wedge clamp and action it will actually clamp itself so um, that's the theory anyway hopefully it all works out now not to do now, just leave it, walk away, and uh, yeah, I might just go have a heart attack. Right, while our main piece is gluing up in our jig now, I'm going to make the frame to sit on top of it. Now, this frame may or may not be used. I haven't decided yet. I'll know when I have all the belts here and um, what I'm going to do, but just potentially, in case it looks bad, fitting the, the belts directly onto onto the piece I've made, I'm going to make a frame for them to sit on instead. It's going to be a very simple frame, so we'll have a top piece, and a bottom piece like this and then two uprights and what we're going to do is do a mortise and tenon so these are going to sit through the middle of both of these so essentially they'll be in the middle if you know what i mean here and here so um i'm going to leave protruding tenons again so 10 mil 10 mil either side so i'm going to cut my tenons out of these pieces and cut mortises into these two pieces i'm going to use a 12 mil middle chisel so when you're marking out your um, tenons and your mortises mark them to the width of whatever chisel you're planning on using to knock out the hole um, because you can just knock your chisel straight through your mortise chisel or just a standard chisel will work just as well for knocking out um, mortises especially in, in tin stuff like this so i'm using a 12 mil chisel and because i'm using a 12 mil chisel um, my piece is 24 millimeters thick so i only need to mark six millimeters in either side and that will leave me with a 12 mil tenon exactly center. So uh, hopefully the camera can see this. Let me see if I can brighten this up a bit. There we go. Now I have it marked around already with my marking gauge. I know you probably can't see the line, the camera might be picking it up there, but I have my marking gauge set to six millimeters now. So that's just, all I have to do is just mark the end of my piece that way and mark it that way and mark it down the sides but if the camera will focus you should be able to see them two lines there now that's my 12 mil tenon exactly in the center so six million on this side 
six mil in on this side and uh, yeah that's my 12 mil tenon so nice and simple i'm just going to mark that down here now down to my shoulder line from my shoulder line up same on this side and then down on this side let's mark this end same thing again so there we go camera is always focusing on the wrong thing that's my 12 mil tenon marked out nice and simple using a 12 mil ch chisel that's going to be the width of my tenon it's going to be the width of my mortise and just setting my mar marker gauge down six mil either side because it's a 24 mil piece so six mil six mil leaves 12 mil uh, nice and simple so when you're dimensioning your timber try and make it easy so that it's easy to mark out with the things you're going to use that's all a uh, nice little tip fee right now i've already cut tenons and stuff in another video so i might just cut these out and i'll get back to you when i'm doing the mortises okay i'm going to chop out these mortises now and like i said i'm going to be using a standard bevel edge chisel now this bevel edge chisel as you can see has slightly thick sides on it so it's good for doing this kind of work again i'm marked to 12 millimeters or half an inch which is exactly the width of my chisel and uh, it's a fairly simple process to do this you just hammer your way through from one side and then come back from the other side so i'm going to actually start just right on the line with my chisel just inside it get it perpendicular to the work like so just hold it there give it a tap and then move forward move forward again and each time I'm going a little bit deeper and you can get a you can wedge against your waste piece and start to remove it. You're not doing any damage because all this is your waste and you can wedge against it and just begin to clean out. So with each cut, you're heading in deeper. Now, as I approach my other side, I don't want to bruise the end of my mortise. So you can go right up to the line again. And because of the wedging action of the chisel, it will actually push you back towards the line. So you're keeping the chisel or the bevel of the chisel faced in the direction you're going the whole time. So I can sneak right up to that line. Take my cuts. I can go right up to the line because the bevel on my chisel is going to push me back away from it. Let's clear that out. And then I want to just take a cut. I'm going to turn my chisel around now. Stand it up. Get nice and perpendicular. And just chop down there. Just give me a straighten up my side wall now, and I'm already by the time I get to the far side halfway through this piece so again start again make your way across Okay, now that I'm more than halfway through, I'm going to flip it around and come back in through the other side. So 
again, it's just the same process from this side. Start right on your line. Get your chisel nice and perpendicular to your work. Take your first cut, just like that, and move up along. Now, there is one mortise cut through from both sides, just using a bevel edge chisel, just using that method. Again, start right on your line, nice and perpendicular to your work. Do your first cut. You're only breaking the surface, and as you move along, you get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper with each successive cut till you get to the far side. Flip your chisel back around. Again, get your nice and perpendicular to your workpiece. Do your cut, work your way back away from that edge. And just do the same from the other side. And before you know it, you'll be true. This is exactly how I did the work or the legs for this workbench. And they are four inch pine and I was through within minutes. So um, it's a good method to use a bevel edge chisel to cut your mortises. Now I'm gonna clean this up and I'm gonna cut the other tree. So I'll do that and I'll get back to you. Right guys, that's just a rough idea of what it's gonna look like there. Now, so you can see the frame on it and where the belts are gonna sit, the five belts are gonna sit up along the frame. I will be drilling holes in the frame and then the belts will be tied on with a nice kind of a black rope. And a lot of finishing and shaping yet to go, but that's just a general idea of where we are in the project. I'm kind of standing up on something here now, so the camera's not very sturdy, but uh, yeah, you should be able to just have a look of where we are at in this project. Right, I think we shall leave it there for this video, otherwise it's gonna get a bit long, and I want to show you everything I'm doing, so it's a little bit more in depth. So um, in the next video, I'm gonna be flattening this, sanding everything back, getting all the corners to meet so all the angles are correct. I might do a little bit more shaping on the frame, I might round off the edges. I'll see when I have all the belts here what I'm gonna do with that. I'm gonna apply a Danish oil finish to this, so I'll take you through all that. And uh, yeah, so that'll make a good interesting part to part two. Shaping, sanding, oiling, and getting this thing assembled and finished. So, uh, as always, guys, thanks for watching and hit like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in part two. Take it easy.